Hello everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Thanks also to the organizers for giving me the chance to speak. So as the video title suggests, this is the second half of a two-part talk, so I'd recommend you check out the first half if you haven't done so already. Uh, there's a link in the description. So today I'm going to tell you about joint work with James Farr. Hi, I'm James. In which we extend Mirzakani's conjugacy between two notions of unipotent flow on Teichmuller space strengthening a surprising link between the hyperbolic and flat geometry of Riemann surfaces. Now, before we get into the full conjugacy, I want to start off with an example from first principles. So fix a pansy composition of your surface. As we recalled in part one, the Teichmuller space of all hyperbolic structures on the surface can now be coordinatized by 3g-3 length parameters and 3g-3 twist parameters after choosing base points on each pants cuff. Um, so this means that, in particular, we can identify Teichmuller space as the product of an orthant, uh, which parametrizes the lengths of the pants cuffs, and a vector space, which parametrizes the twists. These are the classical Fenchel-Nielsen coordinates for hyperbolic structures. We can also use its length and twist data to build other geometries on our surface, though. In particular, there is a unique way to take three half-infinite Euclidean cylinders of given boundary lengths and glue them together to get a pair of pants with a flat code metric. If you prefer, there is a unique meromorphic quadratic differential on the Riemann sphere with three poles of order two and prescribed real residues up to Mobius transformations. Using these flat pants, we can now build a flat cone metric on our surface called a jenkins strebel differential. Just by realizing each complementary pair of pants as a flat pair of pants, then truncating these infinite cylinders at height one half and gluing them together to get a finite cylinder of height one. Just as in Fenchel Nielsen coordinates, we have a choice of how much to twist each cylinder when you glue them together, so in addition to the 3g-3 cylinder length parameters, you also get 3g-3 cylinder twist parameters. So we'll denote the space of all such jenkins treble differentials you get out this way uh, by qt of p, a notation which I'll explain in just a little bit. This shows that the same coordinates would parametrize hyperbolic structures can also be adapted to parametrize the space of flat cone metrics on the surface obtained by gluing together height one cylinders corresponding to the pants curves. These coordinates are sometimes referred to as Dane Thurston coordinates for the set of Jenkins Tribble differentials. Now, we can put these two coordinate systems together into a commutative triangle. Passing through the coordinates, then, we get a map from hyperbolic structures to Jenkins Tribble differentials, which takes hyperbolic length to flat length. There's one more salient feature in this example I'd like to highlight. Not only do hyperbolic structures and jenkins strebel differentials share a common coordinatization, but they share a common group action. Namely, both spaces carry twist flows. On the hyperbolic side, you cut along the geodesics and re-glue after twisting, while on the flat side, you can twist along a cylinder. Both coordinate systems take twisting to translation, and so by passing through the coordinatization, we can actually define a map from hyperbolic structures to jenkins strebel differentials which conjugates hyperbolic twisting and flat twisting. Our goal for the rest of the talk is to emulate this picture for the earthquake and horror cycle flows, which are just generalizations of hyperbolic, respectively flat, twisting. So now let's take a step back and review some relevant definitions so we're all on the same page. The first objects that I should mention are measured laminations and foliations. As we saw in my first talk, a measured lamination is just a geodesic lamination, that is, a closed union of simple geodesics, together with a transverse measure, a measure on transverse arcs, which is invariant under transverse isotopy. Closely related to these are measured foliations. These are just singular foliations of your surface, up to some equivalence relation, equipped with a transverse measure defined as you define a transverse measure for a lamination. Now, these two spaces are actually naturally isomorphic. You can just define a map from laminations to foliations by collapsing the complementary regions, and from foliations to laminations by straightening the leaves. Now, it's not too hard to see that this takes transverse measures to transverse measures, so a measured lamination is essentially the same thing as measured foliation. As such, we'll interchange between these two concepts freely throughout the rest of the talk. With that taken care of, let's move on to the flows. We'll start with the horror cycle flow, a generalization of flat twisting which acts on an appropriate space of flat metrics. So as we know by uniformization, every Riemann surface of genus at least two has a unique hyperbolic metric. This also precludes their admitting a flat metric, so instead we consider flat cone metrics as in our opening example. 
Today we'll be particularly focused on those flat code metrics coming from quadratic differentials. So a holomorphic quadratic differential on a Riemann surface is a section of the square of the canonical bundle. What this means locally is that in coordinates it just looks like some z to the k times dz squared. This gives a flat metric by taking a square root and integrating, which in turn determines a map to c. So you can just pull back the flat metric from c to your surface. The zeros of the differential then correspond to cone points, and the order of vanishing exactly controls the cone angle. While a fixed Riemann surface admits a unique hyperbolic metric, it admits a whole vector space worth of quadratic differentials. These piece together into a bundle of quadratic differentials over the type Muller space, which we'll denote by QT. In fact, using some standard complex analysis, it's not too hard to see that this bundle is actually just the cotangent bundle of type Muller space. The space of quadratic differentials is naturally stratified into a countable union of subvarieties, where you fix the number and order of zeros. We'll denote the stratum with n zeros of orders k1 through kn by qt k1 through kn. Each component of each stratum also carries a natural GL2R action, just by postcomposing the integration charts to C. The Hora cycle flow is then just the action of the upper triangular subgroup on the stratum. It shears the differential. It's often useful in order to understand this flow to actually get your hands on what the flat metric looks like. And to do this, we represent a quadratic differential as a polygon, or as a collection of polygons, in the plane with sides glued by translation, maybe plus an extra 180 degree rotation. This glues up into a surface, and the corresponding differential is just the pullback of dz squared on the complex plane. The GL2R action can then be described just by its action on the plane, and you just take the polygon or along for the ride. For example, you can consider the quadratic differential that I've illustrated on the slide. In this example, the horizontal sides are all glued with their opposites, just top to bottom, whereas the vertical sides are glued a little differently. You can see that the top left and middle left sides will be glued with a 180 degree rotation, plus a translation, whereas the middle right and bottom right sides will be glued similarly. Finally, the top right and bottom left sides will be glued just by a normal translation, no flip. If you trace through, you'll see that actually all of the vertices of this polygon or glued up to a single vertex on the resulting surface. This single vertex will actually ha end up having cone angle 10 pi, so we get a quadratic differential on a surface of genus 3 with a cone angle of 10 pi. Every quadratic differential is also naturally equipped with two singular measured foliations, coming from the horizontal and vertical foliations of the plane. The transverse measure on each records the total variation of the complementary coordinate. So for example, the measure on the horizontal foliation just records vertical height. We'll refer to these as the real and imaginary parts of the quadratic differential by referring to which direction the foliation measures. So the horizontal foliation in particular is the imaginary part. So a classical theorem of Gardner and Mazur then says that a quadratic differential is uniquely specified by its horizontal and vertical foliation, that is its real imaginary parts, and given any two transverse measured foliations, they actually define a unique quadratic differential. We record this by saying that QT the space of quadratic differentials is just equal to the square of the measured foliation space minus some thick diagonal, delta, uh, consisting of the pairs which aren't transverse to each other. This also means that the space of quadratic differentials with a given horizontal foliation, equivalently lamination, lambda, is exactly equal to the space of measured foliations which are transverse to lambda. Note that the Hori cycle flow preserves the horizontal foliation, and hence preserves each one of these subspaces. Going back to our example, we see now that the jenkins treble differentials from before are nothing more than the set of quadratic differentials whose imaginary part is exactly the pair of pants p, where every curve is given weight 1. To generalize twisting on the hyperbolic side, we pass from twisting along a simple closed curve to twisting along a measured lamination. This is what's known as an earthquake. To define these, we first define an earthquake along a single geodesic. This is a transformation of the hyperbolic plane, which acts as a hyperbolic translation on one side of the geodesic, and as the identity on the other. A general earthquake can then be defined by composing infinitely many of these simple earthquakes along all the leaves of the lamination. The amount you shear is then specified by the transverse measure. It's not at all obvious that the result of this shear is actually a hyperbolic surface, but so long as your simple earthquakes always shear in a monotone fashion, that is, always translate on the left side, uh, you actually do get out a new hyperbolic structure, which we call the earthquake of x along the lamination lambda.
Packaging all earthquakes together then yields a flow on the product bundle of Tech Miller space times measured laminations, so that the time t map of a point x lambda replaces x with the earthquake of x along t lambda. Now, the earthquake and horror cycle flows have many similarities, which are usually attributed to the fact that they play the role of unipotent flows associated with the geodesic flows of the Thurston, asymmetric, Lipschitz metric, and the Teichmuller metric, respectively. Concretely, they're also both generalizations of twist flows, they're both Hamiltonian flows of length functions, in fact, and both recur to the thick part of Teichmuller space in a quantitative way. This is a theorem of Minsky and Weiss. However, these two flows really do properly belong to disparate worlds, hyperbolic and flat geometry, and moreover, Minsky and Weiss has shown that their flow lines can in fact be infinitely far apart. All the same, in 2008, Mirzakhani proved that these two flows are equivariantly measurably conjugate, and used this to prove that the earthquake flow is ergodic on the corresponding moduli space, the quotient of type noise space cross measured laminations by the mapping class group. What measurable conjugacy means is that she demonstrated a measurable bijection between two full measure subsets, uh, which takes earthquake flow to horse cycle flow. Specifically, on the hyperbolic side, she restricted to considering maximal measured laminations, that is, those which cut the surface into ideal triangles, and on the flat side, she considered those quadratic differentials with only simple zeros and without horizontal saddle connections. Both of these subsets are generic with respect to the natural Lebesgue class measures, giving the measurable conjugacy. Of course, there are many measured laminations which aren't maximal. We saw at the beginning of the talk that for a fixed pansy composition, we can conjugate between hyperbolic and flat twisting, and we'd like to be able to explain this phenomenon in the framework of Mirzakhani's conjugacy. Our main theorem does just that. In particular, what James and I show is that there is a mapping class group equivariant bijection between type Miller space times measured laminations, the hyperbolic side, and the bundle of non-zero quadratic differentials, the flat side, which extends Mirzakhani's conjugacy between the earthquake and horror cycle flow. Moreover, for a fixed pansy composition, our map takes hyperbolic to flat twisting. It's exactly what we've seen. And finally, it also induces conjugacies on interesting sub-varieties. Specifically, it takes strata of quadratic differentials to the set of pairs x lambda, where lambda cuts x into regular ideal polygons with a specified number of sides. Now, I want to revisit a question I raised in the first talk. In particular, if Mirzakhani's conjugacy works for maximal laminations, why don't we just complete each lamination so that's maximal and then apply our map? This will give you a map from the hyperbolic side to the flat side, but it can no longer be equivariant by the mapping class group because of your choices of completions. Therefore, the resulting map can't descend to the level of moduli space. And in fact, depending on your choices, the map may not even be a bijection. Now, with my remaining time, I want to explain how the coordinates I discussed in part one of my talk allow us to prove this theorem. First, though, we should see how Mirzakhani proved hers. Let's recall from part one of my talk the definition of the Horace cyclic foliation. If you're given a maximal lamination lambda on a hyperbolic surface, you can foliate each spike of each triangle by Horace cyclic segments. This partial foliation, when you pull it back, will extend over the entire surface, building a measured foliation called the Horace cyclic foliation. A theorem of Bonohan and Thurston, reinterpreted by Mirzakhani, then says that the Horace cyclic foliation is a homeomorphism from the space of hyperbolic structures to the space of measured foliations transverse to lambda and that it takes earthquake flow to horror cycle flow. Amalgamating this statement with some classical results is then essentially enough to finish the proof. As we've seen, measured in foliations and laminations are canonically identified by straightening the leaves slash collapsing, and so using the gardner maser theorem, we can identify the space of quadratic differentials with given horizontal foliation lambda with the space of measured foliations which are transverse to lambda. Now using the horror cyclic foliation map, we can identify in turn identify the measured foliations transverse to lambda with type Miller space, proving the conjugacy. Since all the constructions were natural, it's by construction mapping class group invariant. Essentially, to sum it up, the proof is just to disintegrate the product structure coming from the gardner maser theorem, then use Mirzakhani's interpretation of the bronhan thurston coordinates to replace each fiber with a copy of type Miller space. Therefore, in order to extend Mirzakhani's conjugacy, all we need is a natural analog of the horror cyclic foliation for an arbitrary measured lamination, which takes earthquake flow to horror cycle flow. But this is exactly the content of the main theorem of part one. 
So let's recall that the leaves of the orthogeodesic foliation are determined by taking closest point projection to the lamination. This partial foliation pulls back to the surface and extends for exactly the same reason that the horocyclic foliation does. And the main theorem I presented in part one says that the orthogeodesic foliation map is a homeomorphism from the space of all hyperbolic structures to the space of all measured foliations which are transverse to lambda. Moreover, since the coordinates were built explicitly by measuring the shear along the lamination, and both earthquake and horocycle flows act by transvecting the shear by the measure of lambda, we see that the orthogeodesic foliation map by construction takes earthquake to horocycle flow. Now, we can run through the same disintegration type argument. So applying gardner maser and the orthogeodesic foliation theorem, we arrive at the extension of Mirzakhani's conjugacy. The conjugacy on strata now follows easily just by tracing through our construction. In particular, the spine of the orthogeodesic foliation of x with respect to the lamination lambda exactly corresponds to the horizontal separatrices of the resulting quadratic differential, whose real part is O lambda of x, the orthogeodesic foliation, and whose imaginary part is lambda. Therefore, any differential without finite horizontal separatrices necessarily corresponds to a hyperbolic structure on which the complementary subsurfaces to lambda must have cyclic symmetry. That is, the complementary subsurfaces have to be regular ideal polygons. In conclusion, I've demonstrated how to use the orthogeodesic foliation coordinates from part one of my talk to extend Mirzikhani's conjugacy between the earthquake and horocycle flow to an equivariant bijection. But there's a lot more to this map, actually, than just unipotent flows. It also relates hyperbolic length and flat area, Thurston geodesics and Teichmuller geodesics, earthquakes and non-uniquely ergodic laminations, and the tremor flow of Chaika, Smiley, and Weiss. There's still a lot, though, that we don't yet understand, like the interaction of the map with invariant measures or the symplectic structure. I think it's a fascinating question to ask exactly how far this correspondence extends and what new insights into flat or hyperbolic geometry it can provide. I look forward to your questions. Thanks for watching.